Facebook loves videos. If you share a video, they will show that to more people. The algorithm really favours videos. Hey, my name is Felix Tiet. I'm the host of Shopify Master, the weekly podcast powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, anywhere in between. Each week, we invite entrepreneurs like you to share what they've learned growing successful e-commerce businesses. In this episode, you'll learn how you can build a customer base with custom work, but then you should quickly move to selling non-custom products, how to promote your business and other people's Facebook groups, and how to determine if people are actually going to pay for a product instead of just saying they would. Today, I'm joined by Jessica Yasuda from Chasing Planner Peace, which sells a range of refillable, customizable planners with the widest range of planner refills. They started in 2015 in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. Yes, I want to talk about where the idea behind this business came from because you mentioned to us it came out of frustration. Tell us about what you were trying to do and how this gave you an idea to start a business. Okay, so... Um, about six years ago, I sort of fell into planning as a hobby. So there's um, a huge community of people who love using their planners as sort of like a memory keeping or scrapbooking type hobby and decorating it with stickers and washi tape and making it beautiful as well as helping it helping keep yourself organized. Um, and at the time, I was using a Filofax planner which is like a ring planner where you can take the pages in and out. And um, I was buying a lot of like downloadable, printable planner refills from Etsy and printing them out at home because the paper that comes with your Filofax is pretty thin and boring. So a lot of people like to take it out and put something a little bit more um, creative inside. And I was having, I was so frustrated with these printable, downloadable inserts because they were so hard to print at home that I would waste so much paper, so much ink on my computer, and I just, and I couldn't find a layout that actually worked for me either. So I ended up go, saying to myself, I'm actually just going to sit down and design my own layout. I'm going to design my own perfect planner inserts just for my own use. And I spent ages and ages doing this. And then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put it up on Etsy. I'm just going to open up an Etsy shop and I'm just going to put them up there and just see if anyone wants to buy them. And that is exactly how Chasing Planner Peace started, just out of my own frustration. Very cool. Did it surprise you that no one had designed a better solution for this issue that you're facing? Well, uh, so I'm based in Australia and there was one other company that was doing these uh, planner inserts that you could buy already printed. Um, and there's lots and lots of people in the United States that do it, but postage to Australia from the United States is just really expensive. So I, I guess I was surprised that no one else was really doing it in Australia. I could see that a lot of people were doing it overseas. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I'm still only one of a handful of people that do it in Australia. There's still not many people here that do it, do the, the planner inserts. Yeah. Right. Did you notice anything different about the market in Australia that was different from about the kind of products, the kind of needs that your local market in Australia needed that was different than what's more popular around the world? I guess the good thing about Australia is our planner community is very active on Facebook. We have a group called Planner Addicts Australia that has, I think, maybe around 10,000 members. Um, and I'm very active in that group every day. And I've sort of come to know a lot of the other people in that group. So I think what's been really good is that through interacting with other people, like-minded people, I've been able to sort of figure out what people would like and what products people want to see. Right. That makes sense. When you put it on Etsy, what was the first step towards doing it? Like what, what made you feel like doing that? Like did someone come – did you always have this idea that you wanted to own a business someday? What gave you an inkling, that spark to say, let me try putting this online? Well, I have always wanted to own a business, but I didn't think this was going to end up being my business. Um, a lot of planner sticker sellers, so people who sell stickers specifically for your planner, have Etsy shops. So I used to shop a lot on Etsy anyway, and starting an Etsy shop is super easy. I think it took me about half an hour. Um, I did the most 
terrible basic job of it. I did my logo in Microsoft Paint because <laughs> at that time I didn't use any graphic design software. Um, I took my photo of my planner inserts on my coffee table at nine o'clock at night with the light on. Like it was the worst picture ever. I'm so surprised that anyone even bought <laughs> my products at all. Like that still just um, baffles me that anyone even bought my products. So I've come a long way since then. <laughs> um, but Etsy's really easy to start a business on. Like you can start a business with, with one product and a logo that you've done in paint and you can still get sales. So <laughs> yeah. Right. I, th I think a lot of people will encounter this situation where they're like, I don't have the right software. I only have paint. I don't have, I don't have Photoshop. I don't know how to use it. I don't have a studio to take photos. And that's where their aspirations end. They face these obstacles like, well, I can't go any further because I don't have the right tools. But you went for it anyway. The first question I want to ask about this is what gave you the confidence to say, let me just do this anyway, even though I don't have the perfect situation? I don't know, but that is how I have done everything. I have just gone, I don't know how to do it, but I'm just going to have a crack anyway. Um, I'm a big believer in progress over perfection. You know, like you don't, if, if I had waited to have beautiful photos, a perfect logo, a beautifully designed website, I probably would have never started. And sometimes you need to just get out there and do it to see if anyone is actually interested in what you're selling anyway. So the whole whole way through, I have just gone with, you know, just just do it. <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it done. Yeah. Right. What do you think made people buy your first products even though you didn't have the best photos to take or the best logo? What do you think it, you think was it that made it still convincing? I really don't know, but I think it might have had something to do with the fact that my products were priced way too cheaply. <laughs> um, and... I was also really willing to take on custom work. I don't take on any custom work anymore. But at that time, people were like, oh, I see you've got these inserts, these planner inserts. Could you design me something that works for me? And I was like, sure, I would love to do that. So I actually became quite busy just taking on custom work in that first year. But some of those designs have actually gone on to be our best sellers. So it was probably a good way to get started, even though it probably didn't actually, it wasn't really worth my time in terms of how much I was getting paid for it. It was probably really worthwhile in terms of growing the business and getting my name out there and getting more products in my shop. Got it. So you took on custom work to build that first client base of, you know, probably returning customers later to buy more from you. Also, were you able to learn what people actually truly wanted from you? Like what were the learnings? What did you learn about before you took on custom work? Maybe you had some ideas about what the market might want. And now after taking on custom work, what did you learn that changed the kind of products that you offer based on the custom work you were doing? Yeah. So people who uh, are into planning as a hobby, um, they really like to decorate their planners with stickers. So people wanted layouts that would work for stickers. There's like a like a standard measurement of a planner sticker. Uh, it's one and a half inches wide by I think three inches tall. So they wanted inserts that would fit those stickers. So I just came up with lots of different layouts with boxes that were that size. And that's, I think, what people really liked. And that's what people bought. And then we just sort of kept going from there. Yeah. Got it. So is this the path you recommend, especially for the creative entrepreneurs, the ones that are creating their own products like yours? Do you recommend taking this approach of doing custom, almost service-based work first before scaling out into products? I think there's so many different ways you can grow a business. Um, if I was to do it again, I'm not sure if I would do so much custom work, but it definitely worked for us at the time. I think it's really, I think Telling people there's a certain way you should do something is maybe not helpful for everyone because everyone's business is so unique. Um, but for us, doing custom work really did help to grow our client base and some of those people have come back every year for five years to buy their inserts from us. So it did work and it was a good learning experience for me on how to design because when I started, I was I was doing my inserts in Microsoft Publisher um, I, I wasn't a graphic designer and 
I guess that really helped to expand my skill set as well. Okay, so we at least talked about the benefits of what you can get from doing custom work. What did you learn though as you were doing custom work that made you say, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I want to switch, switch to doing something else. And now looking back, like what made you think that you maybe did this for too long? Like what was it about custom work that either you didn't like or that you did that didn't seem like a good fit anymore? Well, it was a couple of things. The first is I wasn't charging for my time appropriately. Um, so it wasn't really worth the time that I spent on it. Uh, to, once I got established and I had regular orders coming in, it wasn't really worth my time to spend, you know, a whole day designing something for someone if they weren't, if they were just going to pay me, you know, thirty dollars for a set of inserts. Uh, and the other problem I found was that people would ask me to design things, and I thought, oh well, you know, when it's finished, I can put it in the shop and sell it to other people. But people were asking for such um, like unique designs that would really only work for them and that perhaps the wider community wasn't interested in buying. So I was coming up with these custom designs for people and literally only selling one copy to them. It just wasn't worth my time. And I found that working on designs that had been requested by more people, like in our VIP group on Facebook, was much more it was was more beneficial because I knew that lots of people wanted to buy it when it was finished. So now I don't do custom work, but we do ask in our VIP group what designs people would like to see. And if there's um, a lot of people that are interested, then I will definitely add that to my list of things to design and I will make sure we get to it at some point. Got it. Once you moved on to selling the products instead of doing custom work, where were the customers coming from at this point? Because uh, you know you mentioned that for a while the traffic came from new customers that wanted custom work, which you priced competitively. So everyone gave you a shot, saw your work, wanted to continue to buy from you. Now that you're moving just to selling your own products and that channel of getting new customers based off of custom work was no longer there, where were you getting the sales and traffic from? Yeah, so by that stage, we had much better photos. <laughs> we had come a long way. I had a better logo. I had a better laid out shop. Um, we had a lot more products. So we were just getting a lot of orders from people either finding us on Etsy, um, which is our international customers tend to just find us through going to Etsy and searching for planner inserts. Um, but a lot of our customers came from Australia from the Planner Addicts Facebook group. People would ask, where can I get beautiful printed inserts in Australia? And people would recommend my shop. So um, most of our customers at that stage came from Australia and came from the Planner Addicts Facebook group or from our own VIP group. So once people had purchased from us, they would be invited to join our VIP group where we stay in touch with our customers. And those people would continue to buy from us. And the great thing about our product is it's not a one and done product. People will buy some inserts for their planner. And because their ring planners are so customizable and you can put all sorts of pages in there, they might come and buy some calendar inserts from us and then come back a couple of weeks later and buy some online shopping trackers or some lined paper or some you know, contacts and addresses pages or whatever. And so we've had people that have come and placed like 30 or 40 orders from our store because they just like to keep adding to their planner and making it work for them. Got it. So speaking of, of all of these different products that you were offering, when you first started the business, did you think that insert, you didn't think the inserts was going to be the product that would take off, right? What, what was the original vision of what you think, what you thought would be the core of the business and how did it end up being inserts? Well, originally, I, I sort of had this idea that I might put together a planner, like a complete planner that people could buy. Um, and at the time, I, I just put the inserts on Etsy as just like a little, I'll just quickly do that, see if anyone wants to buy this layout as planner inserts. Um, but we ended up just sort of becoming so busy doing that, that we did, we sort of left the whole complete planner idea by the wayside. And when we picked it up again and thought, should we do a planner, like a whole planner, we thought, no, because it doesn't actually fit with what is so good about our business model, which is that people keep coming back and buying more and more products. If you sell someone one planner, that's one planner for the whole year, you're not going to see them again till the next year. 
Whereas with our products, we just have people coming to our store, to our online store, you know, regularly. So we're actually really happy with the way that it went because it's just worked out so well for us. Right. That makes sense. When you were able to shift into product into the product space instead of the custom workspace, you mentioned that you were active in this Facebook community called Planner Addicts Australia that you said had 10,000 members at that time. Were you already in that group and active in that community before ever having a store? Yeah. You were. So, so they already knew you at this point. How much of a known person were you there? No, I was pretty active in that group. Um, so I'm definitely my own target market. Like I created this product out of my own need for planner inserts. Um, so I was really active in there. I had been in that group for a couple of years and posted regularly. And yeah, I've made lots of lovely friends through this group and I'm still active in it at the moment. So yeah. For anyone out there that's just starting a business and wants to get more involved in the community or maybe they're already part of a community that they want to serve, What's the best way to almost like gracefully present your product? Because it's kind of an awkward situation, right? It could be awkward at least for people where they're like, well, I have this business, but we're friends. How did you approach like announcing basically that you're starting a business to your community? Yeah. So I guess, um, yeah, don't be, don't be one of those people that just drops your, your link, you know, all the time and um, is just spamming people saying, please come and buy from my, my shop. That makes you look really desperate um, and people get annoyed. So we have rules in the planner group about you can promote your shop once a week and lots and lots of people in that group have a planner shop, whether it's usually selling stickers. So that's that's fine to drop your link once a week and say, you know, we, these are our new releases try and, I guess, um, share something that's of value, something that people might find interesting. But um, you, you, I guess just participate in the group and join in lots of conversations, not just ones about your product. Just be, you know, actually provide some value to the group rather than just sharing your shop. Yeah, I've seen those threads in, in the Facebook groups all the time where they will have a day of a week where you're allowed to promote your business and there's just tons of comments of people dropping their own links in there. That can't be a good place for, for sales and conversions, right? I, I can't imagine that you can really stand out uh, in a promotion like that where like, what, what, are, what are some ways to do it the, the, the right way to stand out? Well, I guess we actually get recommended a lot by other people as well. So um, because we are, there's only really three or four, maybe, yeah, probably about three or four people in Australia who sell these planner inserts. So people will often ask in the group, where can I get the planner inserts from? And people will recommend us or we will put our hand up and say, we can help you. Um, so I think, and I found in other Facebook groups that I'm part of as well, if you just wait for someone to ask the question who is actually looking for a product like yours and then answer them, that's probably a good way to promote your, your business without actually just sort of spamming people if you can actually answer a question when someone is looking for your product. Right. So the approach that you've taken here is that the, the most successful channel that brings in new customers to you is just by being active in the communities, particularly these Facebook groups. Yeah, we get like... 80% of our traffic comes through Facebook. Um, you know, people often complain about Facebook and how it's a massive time-sucking, um, you know, time-sucking website. But um, we have we wouldn't have been able to build our business without Facebook. It's almost entirely built from Facebook. Now we're looking at other channels as well. So we're a bit more active on Instagram and Pinterest and uh, that type of thing. But still most of our traffic comes from Facebook. Specifically, Facebook groups, or, or what part of what part of Facebook? We do run ads. Um, we we spend about three hundred dollars a month on Facebook ads, but I would say that most of it comes from Facebook groups. So there's the planner group, there's our VIP group, and then there's other groups. So um, we have Afterpay as a payment method. I'm not sure if you have Afterpay in the states. No, I saw what you wrote about, but I don't think we have that here. Yeah, so when we got Afterpay, so it's a buy now, pay later type scheme. You buy your product, um, we get paid straight away, but uh, the customer pays back Afterpay in four installments. And once we got Afterpay, we noticed a huge, huge increase in sales on our website. Um, by this time, we had Shopify. And we also noticed that we were able to advertise in groups for people uh, who were looking 
to buy things on Afterpay. And that has been the like a huge source of new customers for us, people who maybe didn't weren't already into planning as a hobby, who didn't have a planner, who wanted to buy a planner um, and could do it on Afterpay. So we've managed to sort of just get so many more sales through uh, one, implementing Afterpay as a payment method and two, advertising in those groups. And that's the same sort of thing. You can You can share once or twice a week. You can share your shop. But it's also answering people's questions where they say, where can I get a planner or a diary or an organiser for next year? Um, and we can say, we, we sell them. You should come check out our website. We have something similar, but not the, the not the company after pay. I don't believe, I don't believe. And there are other method, methods to buy now, basically like a payment plan for customers. Are there any downsides adding this as a payment option for your store? The fees are quite high, but I was already used to paying really high fees on Etsy. And I feel like Afterpay gives me a bit more value for money um, in terms of fees than what I get from Etsy. So, uh, so long as you build that into your product prices, there's really no downside to Afterpay at all. It's been just phenomenal for our business. It really has. Do you know what percentage of your customers are going through the Afterpay method versus just paying outright? It would be more than half, definitely more than half. Wow. Okay. So that's definitely surprising to uh, to me. Now you mentioned that not only are you offering this as a payment option, which increases conversion, but you're also in the afterpay community. I think something important here there where at first we talk about how you promote it or, you know, we're active in the community of your biggest fans, right? The lowest hanging fruit customers are people that are constantly already talking about planning and planners. Now you're going to almost a totally, you know, I don't want to say, you know, too different, obviously, because you have customers coming from the source, but it's, it's not group focused on planning. So you're still able to get customers through basically an unrelated group. Now, what's the method here? Is there is it any different than what you would do inside a more planner focused Facebook group? Can you do things differently in a group where you're probably the only person in there that's talking about your industry, your products, or, or you know, in your case, planning? Yeah, so it's, it's actually, you, it's two completely different sets of customers. So the planning people, they just want the inserts. Um, but the people who, are in the afterpay groups or the organising groups, they want the whole planner with, uh, they want a bundle and they don't want to have to go through all the hundreds and hundreds of different types of inserts that we have on our website because it's just overwhelming. So when when we opened our Shopify store, we actually started to manufacture our own range of planners. So instead of people using Filofaxes or Kiki K planners, they could buy a planner from our store. And we found that what we've done is we've put together different bundles. So we've got like a just a bundle for 2020, a 12-month bundle, which contains a planner and a bunch of our favorite inserts and some dividers. Or we've got a bundle for people who study, a wedding planner bundle. We've put them together so it's just one product that people can buy. And then if we can share a little video of that product in an afterpay group or a organizing group where people are not familiar with planning as a hobby, um, then that we find the conversions are really good there because they can see the video, they can see how it works, that you can take pages in and out, you can customize it, but they can just go straight to the product on Shopify and just add to cart and check out. Otherwise, they get lost <laughs> choosing between all the different things to fill their planner with. So that's, that's definitely a change that we've made on Shopify to cater for those new customers. Got it. So you mentioned that you are sharing pictures in this case of the Afterpay tracker inserts and you're creating products that are specific to other communities. They're obviously almost like new SKUs, but all for the same solution, just more specific for these different communities. Yep. That's really our unique selling point. There's, I don't think there's anywhere else in Australia you can get trackers for all these sort of, you know, uh, like niche niche sort of needs so one of our biggest sellers sorry real quick when you say tracker can you explain that to someone who doesn't know what that's about what's, what's a tracker yeah so the afterpay tracker for example tracks your afterpay purchases and when you need to pay your afterpay payments or a habit tracker tracks whether you have been following your new habits that you want to incorporate into your life so you can tick off whether you've drunk your eight glasses of water every day or, um, you know, done 30 minutes of exercise. So people like to track their, their lives and their habits and things like that in their planner. Um, one of our biggest sellers this year was uh, we have a, in Australia, we have a national 
uh, disability insurance scheme where people who have who care for someone with a disability uh, actually receive funding from the government to help um, to help fund treatments and therapies for people who are living with a disability. And we had been requested lots and lots of times if we could create some planner inserts for people uh, on this disability scheme. And so that's something that we did. And we created a little video of that product, and that's um, been super, super popular. We've we've sold so many of those this year, and I guess it's just that it's yeah, like you said, it's creating a product that's a little bit different um, from just your standard sort of planner inserts that are just your calendar and appointments, that type of thing. So it's really we're, that's sort of what um, where we're really going is creating these unique packages for people who have really specific needs and there's just no other planner product out there that can cater to that. Yeah. How do you know what it's going to be worth your time in terms of having enough demand before, and having enough customers that are willing to pay for a product like this before you invest your time into it? Yeah, so that's really where our VIP group comes in handy. So we have a VIP group that has um, about 3,500 members and it's quite active. People will often post in there asking for if we could create a product for them. And they also share pictures of their planners arriving and uh, can use it as a little space to to interact with other people who are also, you know, our, our, our customers. Um, but sometimes people will say, can you create a package for people, you know, who are using this disability scheme or for pets? People said would love you to create a, a planner to track our pets' um, health and training and that type of thing. And I'll just see if that's validated in the in the group if other people were interested in it as well. Um, so we did a teacher planner this year, and we had so many requests from different customers over the years um, that we had a good idea it would be a popular product. And I guess something like teaching is, you know, that's there's a wide customer base that are going to really enjoy that. Sometimes we do get asked if we could do something, you know, really specific that we just think probably no one else would be interested in, but we might just ask in the VIP group and say, is this something you would be interested in? We have learned over the years though that just because people say they would be interested in it doesn't mean they actually will be <laughs> when it's um, when it's available and they need to spend money on it. So it is something that I'm quite cautious about now when it comes to designing new products. And um, the time to design products is so, so minimal now as well. It, I really need to make sure that if I'm spending time designing that it's worthwhile um, because most of my time is just actually taken up on printing and processing orders at the moment. So, yeah, it's really a matter of just asking in the VIP group and validating it with, you know, more than just a handful of customers. Yeah, a very important point that you made, which is that just because a lot of people, you know, people say that they want something does not mean they were actually put their hard, cold cash down when it comes time to take a credit card to pay for it. Now, through your experience of going through this a bunch of times, are you getting better at recognizing when people are more serious in the sense that they are going to actually pay you for something that you're building? What are, what are like the attributes that you look for these days to determine if it's actually going to be worth it? Yeah, so I guess it's a matter of looking to see if there is an actual community of people out there that will use the product. So, um, for example, someone might ask us if we could do um, like trackers for pen pals, people who, you know, write letters to each other. And I might think to myself, well, there's probably not that many people that are really going to use those inserts. We do have them in the store, but they haven't been a big seller. Um Whereas if people ask for a teacher planner, there's a whole community of people out there that are teachers that would likely use it or, you know, a pet planner. Well, there's lots and lots of people that have pets. It's a big community. Um, same with the disability inserts. There's a big community out there. So that's really where we're going, um, where we're looking to go in the future is designing things for people where there's a whole community of people that would be interested in the product. So not all teachers are going to use our teacher planner, but at least we know there's a population there that we can market the products to. Hey, real quick, if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Let us know what you think or what you'd like to hear more of. Now, let's get back to the interview. Right, that makes sense. Now, I want to talk about the design process because like you were saying, it's involved and you, want, you would certainly prefer to spend more time here. 
talk to us about that. Like when you have decided that it's worthwhile to invest in designing a new planner, what are the steps that you need to take to make sure that's going to be successfully designed? Yeah, so um, I I put a lot more effort into making sure everything's really, you know, uh, perfect these days. I used to just whip things up quickly in Publisher, and now I I use you know Adobe InDesign, and I will really take the time. I will set aside usually on a Wednesday. My kids are at daycare or at school. I've got the house to myself, and I'll sit down and I'll spend you know a lot of a lot of time on it. Um, we ask our customers to review the products as well before they are finalised, especially something that's complicated like a teacher planner or the disability inserts um, or a pregnancy planner. I'll come up with a design and then I will ask if there's some customers who might be willing to have a look at a PDF and provide some feedback. And then, you know, we do a test print, check that everything lines up properly. Um, I have a an assistant, um, Cleo, she's got a really good eye for detail and she'll have a look over it as well just to make sure that everything's um, just perfect and really attractive to look at. Do you get early prototypes? How do you get feedback early on before you finalize a product? Yeah, so when I release it, I want to make sure that it's um, it's like the final version. I don't want to have to go back and sort of um, – you know, release a product to the public and then have to go and make more changes, take more photos, upload the product again. So before I release it, I will actually contact some customers in the VIP group who have expressed an interest in the product. And I'll say, look, I'll send you a free copy if you are willing to have a look at the draft version and provide some feedback on that. And that's, yeah, so I'll make sure I get lots of feedback from everyone, take it all on board, create multiple drafts, um, until everyone's happy with it, and then I will finalize it and upload it to the website. Yeah. Are there any specific questions that you want to ask to pull out whether you need to make any changes to the product or not? Um, not really. People are pretty forthcoming in their opinions. Uh, so with the teacher planner, it was quite complicated. So we did actually contact a, a number of different teachers, and we found that every every teacher has different needs. So it was just a matter of balancing that, not creating a planner that's perfect for every teacher, but just to make the best that we could out of everyone's different requirements, really. Yeah. And that's and that's how it is with, I guess, with all our products is they're not necessarily going to be absolutely 100% perfect for everyone, but so long as they're sort of um, good enough for most people, that's the best we can do. And I think that's going back to that sort of like progress over perfection. You want to create a wonderful product that people love and people are going to buy and you want to do your due diligence in making sure that it's as good as it can be. But, I mean, you can't get caught up in just like endless, um, you know, endless improvements and endless redesigning to the point where it just never gets released, you know, trying to make every single person happy. You have to just kind of go, well, this is as good as it's going to get and I'm just going to, um, I'm going to release it. Makes sense. Now, once they have become a mem- a customer of yours, you mentioned that you will invite them into a, a VIP group. Is this just like a, a Facebook group? Yeah, this is our Facebook group. So this has been really successful, I think, in just creating that sense of like loyalty um, among our customer base. And like, I love our VIP group. It's my favorite place to go on the internet and see all the people that are loving, um, you know, the happy mail that they get and seeing the excitement on the customers because sometimes working from home by yourself, um, it can be like uh, a little bit lonely and a little bit like you're not getting that validation that you're actually doing a good job. And so hanging out in the VIP group, it can be really nice to see people actually happy with what they've bought and see how they're actually using it in their planners. It's super exciting to see that. Yeah, it's definitely important to see the reaction of your customer, to see that you're actually creating something of value in the world and not just be so focused on like, what's that next thing? And actually, I think taking the time to see what you've accomplished, I think it's important for a group like this. Do you have to convince anyone to join these groups? I think a lot of people out there are looking to build a Facebook group of their own, of their own customers or maybe potential customers. What are some ways that you found to be able to get more people to join a Facebook group? So we have um, like invitations to join it basically everywhere so there's I think there's a link on the website but when they order they get an invitation in their order confirmation email 
um, when they get their package, there's an invitation in their package to join as well. Uh, and we always put a link in sort of our emails and our direct marketing like that. Um, and we also have in the past, which has been really successful, is sort of say in the bigger planner groups, like in the planner addicts groups, look, we've released a new planner or we've released something really exciting or we're running a discount at the moment, running a sale. But to see it, you'll have to join our VIP group. And that's been a good way to get our numbers up as well. Right. So give some kind of incentive that only members of the VIP have exclusive access to. So that makes sense. How, how big is that group grown to now? Uh, we have about three and a half thousand members. I think at the beginning I was actually offering all our VIP members a 10% discount on our products as well. Um, and that was a good way to get people to join because they joined to get the discount code. But we actually stopped doing that when we implemented Afterpay because the Afterpay fees sort of worked out to around 10% as well. So we just thought we would sort of swap one for the other so we don't have to put our prices up. Right. Makes sense. How do you spend your time differently in a VIP like your own Facebook group versus a group like the Planner Addicts Australia where it's someone else's group? How do you spend your time differently between yours versus someone else's group? Yeah. So I guess in the VIP group, I want to provide value for people. Um, so we'll often like, I like to ask their the customer's opinions on what do you think of this new design? What would you like to see? I let them know about things before I would perhaps go and advertise it in another group about new designs that are being released or sales that are coming up. And I just feel like it's a lot more conversational, feeling like, like almost like these VIPs are my friends and um, yeah, interacting with them on a sort of a much more personal level. In the planner group, I'm I'm not wearing my business hat unless someone's specifically asking for where they can buy planner inserts. It's more just sharing, you know, um, sharing tips on planning or where people can buy stickers from, that type of thing. So it's different. I'm not just in the planner addicts group as chasing planner piece. I'm there as Jess, <laughs> if that makes sense. That does. You, you can almost be more, not necessarily promotional, but you can talk about your product more, talk about your business and the things that you're offering more in your own group. And that's not seen as acceptable in other people's groups. That makes sense. You did mention that sharing videos in groups, specifically these videos you've talked about earlier, has been effective. What does what, what do the videos look like? Is, 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 how, is it, is, how is it produced? Like, is it a shot on your phone? What kind of videos are you talking about producing? Just on my phone. Um, so Facebook loves videos. If you share a video, they will show that to more people. The algorithm really favors videos. Um, so in some of these afterpay groups that have got so many members like I don't know, hundreds, thousands of members, um, showing a video can be a really good way to actually make sure that people are more likely to see it. So I just shoot it on my phone. I don't have any good equipment at all. Uh, I literally have like my phone attached to a stick that is attached to the ceiling <laughs> um, above my desk. And I will just do like a little flip through of whatever our new product is, our Christmas planner inserts, for example. I'll just do a flip through so you can see what's in there. And then I just use like Windows Movie Maker and speed it up and put some music over the top so it just turns into like a little one-minute clip. And then I'll just share that. And that works really well. It doesn't take a lot of effort to do. I'm not spending heaps of time creating these videos. Um, and then people, are, they can actually see what's involved because it's a bit tricky with products that have got lots of different pages to actually show that in just a photo as well or just some written information. You yeah. try to do a demo video, like not like doing a voiceover or anything. You're just literally showing the product. Is that the idea? Yeah, it's just to show them the product. Yep, just to give, give them an overview. In the VIP group, um, I'll usually do a voiceover and I'll explain what everything is because I kind of feel like those people know me more <laughs> and I'm actually talking directly to them. But for in terms of just advertising our products in the wider community, wider Facebook, I just do like a little video with music. I don't talk. Okay. How do you drop this kind of video into another Facebook group without seeming overly promotional, without getting kicked out? It seemed like there's also another fine balance here between promoting it and someone else's group where the, the admins might not like it. 
Yeah, so I only do it in the groups where advertising is allowed and only do it on those days when you're allowed to advertise. It's really, obviously, really important to respect the group rules. Um, We don't like people coming into our VIP group and advertising their businesses unless we specifically ask, you know, do you have a business? So, yeah, it's, it's definitely a matter of, and if you have a look, there are lots of groups on Facebook where you are allowed to advertise on certain days. So it's just a matter of being smart and waiting for those, um, those threads to pop up or those days to pop up. And using a video can be a really good way, I guess, to stand out from the other people that are dropping, just dropping their links, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that because maybe it's different in the planner, planning community, but whenever I see these groups where people are allowing people to promote, it's almost like always dropping a link and not going to the length of creating a video. I think there's something to, something to be said about putting that extra effort in so you can stand out amongst a sea of maybe not necessarily competitors, but the flood essentially of other people promoting their business. Absolutely. You mentioned that you have a 50% repeat customer rate, which is really high. What's the key to success here? Obviously, having a great product, that's a given. You need to have, that, to have a repeat customer. Are there any other ways through marketing, through anything else that you have set up that encourages people to come back and repurchase? Well, it is really the way the product is set up. So people will come and maybe they'll buy a starter bundle for $100 and then they'll go, well, you know what, I could really put some afterpay trackers in here as well. Or I would really like to, um, you know, put some password, um, you know, password log logs in here as well. And then they'll come back and buy. But I guess uh, the other reason is people at the end of the year, they need new inserts and they keep coming back to buy their new inserts year after year. We do, like I know it's a cliche and I know everyone says customer service is so important, but I really do feel like in a business like ours, customer service is super, super important. So um, I make mistakes all the time. Um, Sometimes parcels get lost in the mail uh, like things go wrong every day, but I always, I really do always just go above and beyond to make sure that the customer's having a good experience. I know everyone says that, but sometimes I see <laughs> conversations in um, seller groups on Facebook where people are just arguing with customers over things like missing parcels or whatever. And I just really feel like you should give the customer the benefit of the doubt and just um, do whatever you can to make sure that they are happy. And, you know, there's that that thing where if you make a mistake and then you fix it, the customer actually feels better about you than if you just got it right the first time anyway. Not that you should go <laughs> and make mistakes on purpose, but that's really, um, I guess, yeah, how I try and run run my business because these customers do literally pay our bills. They do literally put food on the table. So I'm really grateful to everyone that buys from our shop. And so I want to make sure that they're happy. I really do. Definitely. Let's talk about the growth of the business. Can you give an idea of the kind of success you've had in this business since you started essentially? Yeah. So um, when I first started, I was really busy, but I was mostly just doing custom work and I wasn't charging enough for my products. So we weren't really making uh, enough money to live on at all. Um, when in about 2016, my husband actually became unemployed, which allowed me to work on the business pretty much full time because he was home and could help out with the kids. And that's when things really sort of began to take off. Um, we noticed that in the last 30 days, our sales are almost double what they were this time last year. So things are just keep improving and we keep doing things here in the office to make ourselves more efficient. We, you know, batch print things. We um, we just have different ways of doing things to how we used to do them so that we can get more orders out faster. And now we're really looking at scaling it more and bringing on employees and that type of thing so that we can really continue this success. Yeah. Makes sense. When you were able to focus on it full time, what were you able to do that you weren't able to do before? What did you do with the extra time that really helped your business take off? Well, um, we could, I could spend more time designing and uh, releasing new products, which has been really good. Um, and I guess uh, focus on, you know, making sure the photo, taking photos takes such a long time but making sure our photos were good. We actually could set up the Shopify website because before that we were just on Etsy. Really, I mean, running a small business, your to-do list just never, ever ends. But running a small business when you're also looking after three kids at home is really difficult. 
And so being able to just be able to spend the daytime hours as well as the nighttime hours on the business just was was like at the time I was so stressed because my husband was unemployed and the business wasn't making a lot of money. But looking back on it, it actually was such a gift because I was able to just really invest that time, I guess, to grow the business quickly and turn it into what has now become the like a full-time income for our family. Definitely. You mentioned that you want to scale up and take advantage of building the system. What kind of apps and services do you or tools do you rely on to help run the business? Yeah, so um, we do use a few Shopify apps. Um, we have a subscription service, which uh, like a subscription box that people can subscribe to every two months, and they get a box of goodies in the in the mail. So we use Recharge for that, which has been wonderful. Um, we also use Judge Me, which is really valuable because it sends. Uh, email to the customer two weeks after we've fulfilled their order and says, how are you liking this product? And then they uh, can post a review. And that just is really helpful in terms of social proof on the website, in terms of people actually seeing that we have all these five-star reviews and people love our product. So I love the app, Judge Me. Um, And apart from that, I don't think we really use a lot of other apps, actually. Um, Those are the two that we use the most. Um, oh, and we do use Selly, which is an upselling app. And so when people add something to their cart, we can actually cross-sell with another product. So, for example, if they add a study planner to their cart, it will say, do you want to add some study stickers to your cart as well? Or if they buy um, a budget planner it will say would you like to also add these budget inserts as well and that's been really good in terms of getting extra sales coming through awesome so chasingplannerpeace.com is a store it's a website and i'll leave you this last question what was the biggest lesson that you learned so far this year ah i guess the biggest lesson that i have learned this year that's a tough one um I would say that you can't do it all yourself and if you want to continue to you should do it all yourself to begin with you know you need to put in the effort and you need to you need to get across all the different aspects of the business and you need to make sure that you know how to do everything but at some point um, you can become so busy that you actually need to say if this is going to continue to grow I need to get someone else to help me with it so about a year ago I brought on um, my assistant, Cleo, she's a school mum. I've known her for years and she's always been super interested in the business. And she now helps with a lot of social media and the newsletters and things like that. And we're looking to bring on more people and grow the team because at some point you've only got so many hours in the day. And I didn't start a business to work 24 hours a day. So we need to, yeah, I guess that's the thing. At some point you need to outsource and you need to just say, I can't do it all. Awesome. Definitely awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you so much, Felix, for having me. I've had a wonderful time. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify. 